They thought they'd found a dream home. It won't go much further than that before it collapses. We were expecting at least 15, 20 years. Now we'd be lucky to have another 12 months. You've got to expect two to three floods on a normal year and five floods on a bad year. But their dream was to turn into a nightmare. If this project goes wrong, we are destitute. In their homes from hell. <laughs> We all long for an amazing home in a beautiful part of the world. For some, the search takes them to foreign climes where the sun always shines. For others, it's about discovering that hidden corner of Britain with its amazing views. Tonight, we follow the people who thought they'd found a dream home in paradise, but instead found hell. From the angler who bought a home close to the river he loved... I envisaged being next to the river for my fishing. But instead of landing fish, he landed himself in trouble. I've challenged it, which is my right to challenge it. You might have challenged it beyond one yet. The couple whose fantasy of a new life under the Spanish sun now lies in ruins, just like the home they'd always longed for. All of the external works, all of these walls, the patios, all the pathways, the stairs, the external walls, the roads, they're gone. And the people whose dreams of a house by the sea are being washed away. It's heartbreaking, really. The thing that I've loved all my life is going to destroy me. For Jim and Barbara, finding their dream home was the completion of a story that started 45 years earlier. They met when they were teenagers. At 16, Jim joined the Navy, and after a few years of dating, he popped the question. We became engaged, um, but then he was off to sea again, which wasn't very nice for me, I suppose. I met somebody else, and uh, so Jim came home on leave one time. I said, I'm sorry, this isn't going to work. But the sad thing was that we'd planned our wedding and everything had to be cancelled. But Jim didn't hold a grudge. 25 years since he'd last seen her, he was preparing to go back to live in Canada and pop to Scarborough for a visit. He walked into my place of work very unexpectedly when I was 55 and he was 56. And uh, we shook hands and... That was it, magic. I had my uh, my girl again, and that's where that's where when we started our relationship. They got married and spent several years in Canada before deciding to relocate for their retirement together. They set their sights on Madeira, a small Portuguese island north of the Canaries, with a population of just a quarter of a million people. The minute we landed on the island, I felt uh, bowled over by the beauty of it. The climate is fantastic here, um, with lots of sun, so we were going to start a very new life. It does tick all the boxes, really. Jim and Barbara searched for a developer and were impressed with Clearview Homes Group. They had a wonderful site, they had some wonderful projects going on, and um, seemed to be a, a good, thriving business, which impressed us very much. The deal looked appealing. Jim and Barbara paid 295,000 euros up front. For that, the house would be finished in a year. They would get free accommodation in Madeira until it was built and a 25% discount to boot. You know, we realized that handing your money over is, is a, serious, a serious proposition, but we did feel that, you know, the price uh, was was worth that. In November 2007, they signed away 295,000 euros to secure the home they had always dreamed of, plus an extra 50,000 euros to invest in another Clearview property deal. It was their life savings. Almost all of our money was taken up with the Clearview and invested in the Clearview company. We had a contract, and uh, we did feel that everything was in order. 
We were very excited about the prospects of having a house that we'd really chosen and had tailor-made to fit our needs. Yeah. And um, early on, after we'd signed the contract, things started to take off very, very well. And there was a huge workforce on the site. And uh, surprisingly, everything went up very quickly. So we were there on a regular basis watching it and enjoying every minute. But in July 2008, they began to worry that something was wrong. We came one day, you know, another one of the visits, and there was nobody here. Over the next few months, work on their property was sporadic. Yes, the alarm bells started ringing then, so really, in, did, a big, yeah. in a big way. We realised that things, some, some very serious stuff was happening. Of course, we called for meetings immediately. Well, we were always reassured that everything was going to be perfectly all right, there was enough money to finish the project and to go out and choose the fittings and fixtures that we needed to finish it, so, which we did, we still did, because we always thought that it was going to be completed. But the reality was different. The company admitted it was having financial difficulties. Jim and Barbara demanded their investment be returned. Before the Christmas, we asked for the money back on the whole deal, which was our 345,000 euros. And one thing I always kept saying to them was, if this project goes wrong, we are destitute. And they said that that would never happen. So they agreed to drip feed us some of our money, and no money was forthcoming. And then in the February, I believe, when we really confronted them again, they said they had no money. The Archers sold their business and home in Canada to retire in Madeira. Although the house is almost finished, they don't own the deeds, and they've never spent a night there. This is the first time since 2009 that Barbara has seen the home she may never be able to live in. Oh, dear. Oh, that's just awful, isn't it? What a mess it is. It's dreadful, Not much really. of a dream now, is it, darling? Certainly don't think we'll be sitting by that pool, will you? Come on, well, let's go and look inside. Oh, Where's gosh. the kitchen? Oh, my gosh. That's dreadful, isn't it? This was a lounge. And this part here was the dining area. Well, small is beautiful, but this is where we would have... Yeah, we chose this bedroom because it was so beautiful. And I'd be better think about it, Jim. It's bad news, really. Wow, still the same view. Fantastic, Fantastic view. Fantastic, isn't it? It would have been uh, it'd be nice to sit up here with the railings and whatnot. The house had never legally been theirs. They had lost their home, and their entire life savings. Jim and Barbara also believed that Clearview may have remortgaged some of the development to release more money. Although this is not illegal in Madeira, it was a worrying development. We firmly believe that they had the cash, it should all have been spent on this house, and it should have been finished for us. So where our money went to, we'll never know. For me, it's like the very worst thing that could happen in your life, and of course, if it happens when you're 63, it's a hell of a lot different Same, to when you happen as a young person. Yeah. Jim and Barbara thought they'd be spending the rest of their lives in Madeira. So they shipped all of their belongings to the island and held them in storage. With their retirement dreams over, their possessions are going back with them to the UK. But Jim and Barbara can only take items that can fit into their suitcases. They have to choose what to leave behind. And we've got to decide about how and when we're going to move it. Do we just sell it? Do we give it away? Do we cut our losses again in this one or not? We virtually have nothing left of our former life. And to lose the furniture as well would, would be awful for me. To add to their misery, the underground garage where their possessions have been stored flooded. The sight that greets them is yet another harsh blow. Everything is damp. It's absolutely awful to handle. Well, what we've got to do, Jim, is decide what is the most important of sentimental value that you want to hang on to. I'm looking for my family photographs and stuff like that. Oh, well, these look like our wedding photos. 
Rather nice to have those back. Nice memories. There's a teddy bear. They're my treasured possessions. <laughs> I've had this for. teddy bear since I was three years old and my mum made it for me. It's the most ugly thing on earth, but I love it. And that's one that my husband bought me. So they're going back to England. Definitely. It just feels like a wreck down there to me. What I was hoping for was something better than what I actually saw. It was very, very sad to see all our belongings in such a poor state. I could shed some more tears over this, I'm afraid. It looks as though the dream is finally over, doesn't it? As if we've been knocked again. It's almost worse than losing the bloody money. It sounds ridiculous, you know? <laughs> it's like... Well, for somebody who didn't really think about the belongings and the too deeply... Well, you know, the thing is, is really it's, it's, it's the closing of the chapter, really, and... Uh... Anyway... We wrote to the directors of Clearview Homes Group. Jacinto Gomez did not respond. David Alban says the company failed because of the recession and says there was no deceit or wrongdoing on their behalf. He says he was asked to leave the business but was given assurances the Archer's problems would be resolved. He says he's sickened to hear this is not the case and sincerely apologises. Back in the UK, Jim and Barbara found themselves homeless and penniless. Instead of entering retirement, Jim has taken a job and Barbara runs a pub 14 hours a day, six days a week. This is so far removed from what I ever had in mind. Having had a pub in the 80s, when I was 30-something, um, was pretty easy then, but uh, to have to come back and relive that again is uh, not what I would choose ever. But instead of despair, Jim and Barbara remain upbeat and thankful for that day back in 2003, when they rediscovered each other and the love they shared for one another. I don't actually know of anybody that I could have uh, done it with without, other than Barbara, because she's a surprisingly strong, resilient woman. In reality, you know, we have strengthened our love for each other. The Archers are still pursuing Clearview Homes Group through the courts in Madeira, but for now, they're pulling pints instead of sipping sweet Madeira wine on their balcony. I think we're both resigned to fighting this for as long as we possibly can with as little as we we have we, we will continue to fight in any way from last orders to last chances the man who put his house on stilts and now has a wobbly future to now face the possibility that i'm going to lose this it's devastating and the predicament of the cracks and chaos around this Spanish home. I can't imagine how we could even begin to put this right at the moment. As places go, they don't come more tranquil than this. Eleven years ago, angler and rod maker Peter Johnson came across a two-bedroom cottage for £26,000 near the River Dee in Cheshire. The peaceful location offered Peter the kind of isolated lifestyle that he craved. And as you can see and you can feel, the ambience of, around you is, is, is so peaceful, so quiet. It's just a, a, a wonderful place to have a home. It's, it's absolutely amazing. After a lifetime of working, it offered an escape from the pace of modern life and allowed him to dedicate time to his great passion, fishing. I envisaged it as my retirement home, being next to the river for my fishing and my angling. It's home. It's, it's like we say, every. Englishman's home is his castle, and that's, that's what it is to me. Peter bought the cottage in March 2000 and set about redecorating. This has been completely renovated, but keeps the theme as it was when I first saw it. When he bought the cottage, Peter knew it came with quite a significant drawback. It sat on a floodplain. 
the flood season is between October and March each year, and I'm talking dramatic floods. Two, three, four feet of water so that you cannot see the riverbank at all. In the past, the floods have been so aggressive, they'd come up the drive and into the house, effectively leaving the home an isolated island. You've got to expect two to three floods on a normal year and five floods on a bad year. Uh, so you, you need to do some serious work to stop that happening. So Peter, afraid that he would lose his retirement cottage to the rising floodwaters, consulted the Environment Agency about how he could protect his home. He says they recommended raising the cottage, but to do this, they told Peter he would need planning permission from the council. The main task was to get the building up in the air during that sort of summer time of 2000, because having done the renovations on the inside, I didn't want to come up to the flood season uh, and, and have all that internal renovation destroyed. Fearful that floodwaters could sweep through his home at any moment and ruin his property, Peter didn't apply for permission. He just started lifting the cottage. I'd already bought the place. It was already becoming my home steadily. I'd started renovations, so I just proceeded with the work. I felt a bit... Um, Trepidation, I suppose, really, was the word. I wasn't totally scared because uh, I hadn't paid a lot of money for the old girl, but I'd paid enough to, to concern me that I'd, I had only got one shot at this. Lifting the home he loved was a massive job, and Peter says he did the whole thing himself. Each one of the jacks I took up an inch at a time, worked all the way around clockwise, uh, and regimented it as well because it was a bit precarious. I went all the way around until it had gone up six separate lifts and attained the height that the flood defence engineers had recommended. I think it was 1.354 metres, to be precise. He then brought in 3,000 tonnes of soil and increased the level of the land immediately around the property, so it no longer appeared to be on stilts. And again, this was without planning permission. He knew he needed it, but thought he could get it retrospectively. So I commenced infilling the ground, and raising the ground all of the way around the property. And this is what it looked like when it was finished. During the flood season that followed the work, Peter says his house was protected from the rising waters. Later, the council wrote to Peter to say it would give permission for the work he'd done to raise the house onto the pillars. However, it did not give permission for raising the land around the house because Peter didn't apply for planning permission and over the years, Peter never sought the necessary consent required by the council. An enforcement notice followed, asking him to remove the extra soil around the property, but Peter refused. In the case of this flood, round the corner of my conservatory, looking south across the property, all of that ground will have to be removed to its old level to comply with the injunction. Right now, in filming this, I'd be sort of chin deep in water around the cottage, completely surrounded by water. There'd be no access, so once the flood arrives, you'd physically be marooned in the cottage. Peter decided he would not comply with the enforcement notice. Instead, he hired a lawyer to help him appeal against it. It was the start of an 11-year campaign that would take over his life. This is what I call my campaign area, where I do all of the fighting for survival, really. All the files that you can see, there's just a mass of A4 files of documentation associated with the enforcement action. We took all of the A4 folders and we stacked them up and we measured them and they came to four foot six. Peter didn't win his appeal. Consumed with what he sees as an unjust ruling, he's even taken his case to the High Court, but lost. Peter now owes the council £45,000 in court costs, which he can't afford. The council says it's happy for Peter to pay in instalments. However, if Peter can't do this, he will have to resort to selling his home just to settle the bill. To now face the possibility that I'm going to lose this is, is just it's devastating. 
soul destroyer. With his future here far from certain, we called in Janet Askew, a planning and environment expert from the University of the West of England. Must be. God, look at the river here. Oh, wow, God, it's incredible. After reading all the documents relating to his case, she hoped she would be able to help Peter reach an amicable solution with the council. Janet was unable to drive to his house because the area around his home was flooded again. Hello! So instead, she met him in the local pub. The first letter that you wrote to the planning department before you bought it, you wrote to the planning department and said that you wanted to do certain things and you asked if planning permission was needed. So I think that in general that's a really good thing to have done. I think that's the kind of thing people should do. They wrote back to you then, didn't they? And they said you and needed planning permission. they said that permission. they didn't control that aspect of planning permissions and planning generally. Mm. It was controlled by Environment Agency Flood Defence Manager's Office, North Wales. Well, I, and I was to go okay. to them and get their All right. advice Well, that's and really interesting, actually, because I think that might be a sort of misunderstanding in a way. Because, yes, the Environment Agency are the experts on how you can affect flood defences, but... Right there's another set of regulations which would require that you need a planning permission to do that. So the Environment Agency in itself can't give planning permission, it can only give you advice as to how to do it, and then the planners could say whether or not you needed permission. I and I think that original letter did say you needed planning permission no. To, no. No. To, to, to do the lifting of the house and, and, to, and to raise the level of the land. Not at all, no. The Environment Agency say they advised Peter he would need consent from their department in Wales and planning permission from the local authority before proceeding with any work. I think the other thing that, and I hope you forgive me for saying this, but and you, don't, you never seem to have taken no for an answer. And over and over and over again, the planning inspectorate uh, said that you were in breach of planning law in what you've done to your home, but you've never accepted that. I've challenged it, which is my right to challenge it. I can apply to the yes, High Court, right. yeah, of course, which yeah. I've done. You might have challenged it, but you haven't won yet, have you, at the end of it all? Um, you know, there's still, it's still there, it's still rumbling away. Oh, yeah, and it will continue to rumble away, because they're wrong. Clearly, he's given himself an awful lot of pain and anxiety for many, many years, 11 years, he says, and I... I still think it was avoidable. People always want to develop their home. Lots of people want to do developments in their house, but they never want their neighbour to. And that's what planning exists for. And in his case, anything that he might do to his house has an impact on the whole landscape and on his neighbours that are down the road and possibly implications on the floodplain. I honestly don't believe that there's ever any conspiracy against people by town planners. The local council tell us Peter has no one to blame but himself. That he has ignored successive council's advice and refused to comply with directions of the local authorities and the courts. I don't feel that I own it anymore because of all of the enforcements that have been taken and the various rulings by the judiciary. I, w I would like to get my home back to be mine and have a little bit of peace and, and quiet again, you know? From a house that's built to one that's falling apart. The couple who can't leave their crumbling home. Everything that we own is here. We, we couldn't just walk away. Southern Spain. For decades, this sunny corner of Europe has been luring Britons to its shores. For many, the glorious weather and relaxed way of life has enticed thousands of Britons to up sticks and make Spain their permanent home. Grupo Massa is one of the countless Spanish developers profiting from this trend. One of its developments is Camposol, near the Costa Calida. Building started in 1999, and there are now more than 4,000 homes. It resembles a new British town, nestled near the foothills of the panoramic Sierra de Espuña. It's easy to see why, in 2008, 
Colin and Angela Bryant Chesworth from Croydon sold their terraced house and bought a brand new three bedroom, three bathroom villa for 189,000 euros. Okay, then into our home from the um, sun terrace outside, coming straight through into the lounge diner and our lovely corner sofa. Yeah, I chose this. You did, you did. <laughs> and the colour? Yep, yeah, red. Consequently, everything afterwards has got a hint of red in it, With even down to the carpet carpets and, and the, the curtains. curtains. <laughs> and in the kitchen, we had a choice of what units and worktops we wanted. So uh, this is what we chose. OK, so we come from the kitchen out into um, the bedroom upstairs. Rather uniquely with these villas, you have to come out of the property to go to external stairs up to our bedroom. And through into our bedroom, uh, just to your right, you've got the um, ensuite. And then from our bedroom out onto the big sun terrace, again, all the furniture from England, chosen by Angela. And then um, our street and all the other villas. Their first summer was everything they could have dreamt of, sipping sangria and eating tapas on their sun terrace. And Colin tried to make a go of his new business venture, being a fitness instructor to the rest of the British residents on Campusol. But in the winter of 2009, their idyllic lives on the vast Campusol development changed forever. It all started with Colin's daily workout in his gym come shed at the back of the garden. On the morning of the really heavy rain, I still got up to train and I still went into the gym around the back of the property and I trained in it. And although there had been some sli slight leaning of it, we, we just to say at the time put it down to natural movement, it was quite literally a couple of hours later we were inside the property now and I said to Angela, I'd better just go and check to make sure there's been no further movement. And then to my absolute surprise, I've walked around and at this point it's gone to 45 degrees. I managed to open one of the doors. The other door I couldn't open because the, the land had gone so much. Over the coming weeks, the land around their home started to move. Day by day, the walls began to crack and fall away. Their swimming pool started to buckle and sink. And the problem appeared to be spreading. The paths outside their villa just fell away. The area resembled a disaster zone. Colin and Angela's dream life in the Spanish sun was crumbling away before their eyes. But this is not the first time there have been problems in Campusol. In 2008, Homes from Hell's John Top came to investigate extraordinary goings on in another part of the vast Campusol development. See how much is pulled away. What on um, earth is going on here? Yeah. Seems to be a huge issue with the ground here. I mean, this indicates massive sort of ground settlements here. I cannot believe how far that's gone. That is and extraordinary. You can tell by the tiles how, how far it's gone. Oh, see. yeah. Oh, it's very clear. The vast Campusol development covers more than six square miles. It's divided into four sectors, A, B, C and D. The homes John saw in 2008 were on the edge of sector D. At the time, Grupo Massa said the problems were mainly a result of works carried out by residents to gardens and basements. They said they'd resolved some of the cases involved. But now it's sectors B and C where the problem of extreme subsidence appears to be happening. Colin and Angela's home is in sector C, which is one street back from the edge of a vast golf course. While we were on Campusol, we counted 70 homes in this area with visible signs of cracking. Some are worse than others. Around them, walls and roads have opened up to the elements. Grupo Massa say they're aware of 15 homes with structural problems. It's November 2010, and John Top is back in Campusol. He wants to see if there is any advice or help he can give to Colin and Angela. We almost get my head through that crack, actually. It's huge, isn't it? Yeah, you can feel the sloping the land as well. You actually feel like you're going to... Yeah, everything's, everything's like one of those... one of those houses of mirrors that are fun for, isn't it? Grupo Massa says it's not responsible for subsequent works carried out on the homes. In Colin and Angela's case, as well as many others, it says the problems are caused by the swimming pools, which were not built by the company. It claims they don't comply with the structure of the residences and have altered the land, causing damage to the houses. Down here, because this is dangerous. 
but the problems of subsidence go beyond their home. Wow. This was all level. And what happened was it sloped completely down. Um, so if a neighbour decided to hire a jackhammer and break this down, because what happened was there was a collection of water underneath, so it was in a vain attempt, break it up and try and dry it out a little bit. That here was the same height as that. Well, um, OK. I mean, it's a bit overwhelming, to, to be honest, when you first see it, because I can't imagine how we could even begin to put this right at the moment. You can't get in and out of the property safely. You can't even walk outside your back door. It's clearly unacceptable. Well, I'm I, a I young person. If, if someone was impaired, God knows how they'd do this. No, I they just don't know. John wants to check whether, in his professional opinion, the house is safe to live in. And that means a close inspection of the foundations. What I've found down here is the original foundation system. I can actually see the tops of the foundation poles. You should never be able to see those. Um, once they're installed and once the building's constructed, you should never see the head of a pile again, but I can here. And that could be a problem, since it suggests the ground beneath the house may have sunk. All around, people's dream villas are cracking and crumbling. And for Angela and Colin, their horrific situation has the potential to get a whole lot worse. If their villa goes down the same route as their neighbours, the quirky external staircase on another property is separating from the upstairs bedroom. If that happens to their house, they'll need a ladder just to go to bed. It appears here that the, the buildings or their building is probably OK, but everything around it seems to have dropped away massively. I mean, by we're talking feet. Unbelievably, Angela and Colin's neighbours seem to be even more badly affected. I don't think I've seen a standing building that has gone so far out of square. Yep, yep. It won't go much further than that before it collapses. Buildings do generally want to stand up, but once you've got leans like this, yeah then it is well on its way to collapse. They are very, very lucky to be alive. Very, very lucky indeed. Two streets back from Colin and Angela and the property which cost retired Roger Wilkins 100,000 euros appears to be moving. I've owned this property for approximately five years. Basically, I bought it as a, an investment for my son. A week last Sunday, I brought some friends over who were staying with us for the night. And when we walked in, we were greeted with this devastation. But this water heater was actually part of the wall unit and has now crashed down straight through a brand new microwave. And another wall appears to have moved. And this spirit level is only 60 centimetres, but in 60 centimetres, the wall is out 10 millimetres. In other words, the wall is now leaning like that. And the problems are not just on the inside. When I bought this property five years ago, this road was absolutely dead flat. Unfortunately, now, when you look at from end to end, there are lots of lip ripples all the way along. But it's especially dropped now in front of our property and by at least two foot. And as we can see down here, I have put up at least three tonne of gravel here over the past 12, 18 months. And this ground, it just keeps dropping down and down and down. It is just a never-ending story. Roger had wanted to spend quality time here with his granddaughter, but now he's too scared to let her into the house. In the meantime, Colin and Angela are wondering whether the problems with their house will get any worse. John has the answer. At the moment, I'm satisfied that it's, it's safe and I'm satisfied that nothing's going to happen suddenly. Doesn't mean that something won't happen. I mean, there's been a little bit of movement. Whether the building is going to stand up, that's one thing. Whether it's suitable for inhabitation is another. All of the external works, all of these walls, the patios, all the pathways, the stairs, the external walls, the roads, they're gone. You know, they've got no value. They've got to be swept away and started again. But of course, that's an essential part of our infrastructure. It's all and good having a safe house, but if you can't get to your house because the land around it is so dangerous... I don't know how you will go on living in conditions like this, frankly. I mean, you have to do something about this because you just can't use it. 
At night, some parts of the campus old development are affected by a different set of problems. Paul Byrne is 65 years old and has lived on campus old for 11 years. It is now about quarter past six in the evening. There will be no light now till daylight comes back in the morning. It was all right 11 years ago, but gradually, yeah, as lights go out, they don't, they're not replaced, and now the roads are in, are in complete darkness at night. Everyone's passing the blame for who should do the work. In 11 years, you would have thought it would have improved, but it's got worse. I say a lot of people are moving away. A lot of people are leaving. But for Colin and Angela, moving away is not an option. In its current condition, it would be impossible to sell their property. It's worth a fraction of the original asking price. Grupo Massa say Colin and Angela have not contacted them over the problems with their home. Grupo Massa's central office also say it's not aware of Roger's complaint and says he, along with most other residents, has a 10-year guarantee which covers any structural problems with the house. Every time it rains, we worry because we don't know what will happen next. It's our home. If we walk away, where do we walk to? Everything that we own is here. We, we couldn't just walk away. From the dry hilltops of Spain to the wet and windy Yorkshire coast, the people whose love for the sea has brought them only heartbreak and hell. It does feel like the end of my world, end of my life, because it's all I've got now, from an absolutely glorious dream home to an absolute home from hell. Living by the coast with its bracing air and beautiful views is some people's idea of heaven. As an island nation, Britain's fortunes have been shaped by the sea. In the last series of Homes from Hell, we visited the East Riding of Yorkshire. It's got one of the world's fastest eroding coastlines. And as the sea advances, it's forcing a change in fortune on the residents who live there. In the last series, we heard from Colin and Josephine Arnold, who bought Cliff Farm in 1988. The seven bedroom farmhouse had land for them to run a small caravan park and of course, a stunning sea view. We estimated we'd have about 30 years, which is a long time. Then in 1995, a huge storm hit. The land just disappeared. It was, wasn't there any longer. When I looked out of the window, garden fence had gone, gate had gone. And we had chickens and that then, didn't we? And the chickens were just yeah. sort of stood there, with half their house missing. But the sea hadn't finished with them yet. In 2007, the East Riding Coast was hit by some of the most extreme weather in decades. Colin and Josephine filmed the damaging seas as they wrought havoc on their home and business. That was really frightening, because my brother was actually in the house when the sea smashed through the door and it picked him up and took him into the next room. And it just left the house four feet over, hanging over the cliff edge. Very sad, very sad indeed. Sorry. <laughs> doesn't like talking about it. I can still see the way it was. And the people that used to come, and it's too much. <sighs> when we last saw Colin and Josephine, their home, Cliff Farm, was perilously close to the edge. Today, the house has been demolished, and part of the land it stood on has gone. The couple are living in temporary accommodation, but hope to move into a council house very soon. Also in the last series were Alan and Sylvia Hughes. They lived further along the coast in Albra. They bought their home in early 2005 and signed the deal 
with their eyes open. We were expecting at least 15, 20 years. But now we're lucky to have another 12 months. The seaside road has collapsed. Well, the road just went straight out. Obviously, it just goes straight down now. And their home could be next. The Environment Agency can't afford to protect all of Britain's coastlines. They have to choose which areas to save, and this area never got any sea defences. Finally, we also met John Hinchcliffe, who has lived in the East Riding's village of Skipsey for 10 years. When he moved here, it was a dream come true. I've always been attracted to the sea, always, all my life, long as I remember. And this, when I saw this, when I came and I looked in through that front conservatory, out to this, I couldn't believe that if I'd won the lottery, I wouldn't have thought I could have lived anywhere better. Ever the optimist, John thought it would be 30 years before the sea swallowed up his home. If you can see where the tide is just rolling into now, that is where the cliff top was. So it is literally, in the last three years, from where we are stood to where the sea is, has completely disappeared. But time and tide wait for no man, not even John. I think the house will be in the sea in three to five years. There's no escape in it, none whatsoever. Absolutely sickened. It, it does feel like the end of my world, end of my life, because it's all I've got now from an absolutely glorious dream home to an absolute home from hell. John, Alan and Sylvia were all drawn here by the sea. Ultimately, it will be the sea that drives them away. In December of last year, Homes from Hell came back to see what had happened to these residents of East Riding. Alan and Sylvia have decided to move out and have now been rehoused by the council eight miles inland. Every time you went to sleep on a night and you felt the cliffs shaking your chalet, it got to such a point where you couldn't ignore it anymore. You couldn't pretend that you've got years or time to think about that later because all of a sudden you didn't have any time. Unfortunately, we haven't got the sea view anymore. But then again, this place ain't falling in the sea either. Today, the council will be demolishing their old house. It's dangerously close to the cliff edge. Alan and Sylvia have come to say their goodbyes. Yeah, right, Dave, can you just bring everything from the roof down and bring it away from the fencing, please? Thank you. It's all over in five minutes. It is sad, but you, you just get on with it. And today is like, you know, end of old life, beginning of, of the new. We won't have a view like that anymore, darling, will we? Yeah. Miss that. Miss that a lot. Of all the people Homes from Hell revisited, only John Hinchcliffe is still living in his coastal home and he vows to stay on till the very last. It's heartbreaking, really, because uh, the thing that I've loved all my life, the thing that I came here to be by and see, is going to destroy me. But how long he has, no one can tell. There could be another five years yet, but there could be five days. 
It all depends really on uh, that out there and him up there. I, I have invested in some armbands though, which uh, I go to bed in now. It's now summer 2011, and amazingly, the sea hasn't claimed any more of the coastline surrounding John's house. And he's taking the opportunity to enjoy each and every day in his dream home. I used to dread getting up in the morning and looking through the window, because the first thing on my mind was, what's, what's gone and how much today? I can say with great pleasure that he has smiled down upon me, because in the last 15 to 18 months, nothing's gone whatsoever. For my happiness, I would easily score nine and three quarters out of 10. As for our other homeowners, Colin and Angela continue to live alongside the cracks in their home in Spain while hoping they don't get any worse. Peter Johnson says he won't be removing the soil from around his house because he can't afford to. He still hasn't paid the council the money he owes in court costs. And for Jim and Barbara, the battle rumbles on as they continue their legal fight to salvage the life savings they lost. If you've got a story about a home from hell and would like to get in touch with us, our email address is homes at itv.com. Happy and, well, not so happy memories of marriage from Weatherfield tomorrow night. And who could forget Curly Watts and Raquel's wedding charting the Corrie years tomorrow at 7.30. And the cast join Keith Lemon tonight for Celebrity Juice after the news next.